So thank you so much for being willing to talk with us today, Bruce. I'll just introduce you briefly and then we'll jump right in. Um, so this uh, is a, the third um, video of a series on coherence therapy. And I did the first two videos and I, and I was sure that people would really love a chance to hear from Bruce directly who co-created coherence therapy. But today I just wanted to talk with you, Bruce, about you know, what makes coherence therapy unique, um, specifically this piece of the work being non-counteractive where we're looking to find the roots underneath the symptom versus just managing the symptom. So yes. I, I'm, I'm going to really let you do most of the talking, um, but I would love, that would be my wish is to hear you speak. Mm -hmm. about All that. right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good, good. Yeah. I'll focus on that stuff. It's really foundational for our approach. Yeah. Well, let's see. Maybe uh, just to define what we mean by counteractive, that term, uh, it's it's I, 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 my sense is that most of the methods in the whole wide labyrinthic field of psychotherapy um, are counteractive, at least to some degree. Counteracting means uh, directly trying to build up preferred uh, states of mind or behaviors to happen instead of the symptom, the problem pattern that the client has presented. Uh, so, for example, what? Uh, positive thinking, building up positive thinking to counteract depression, to, to try and reduce the in strength of depression. Uh, teaching relaxation techniques to counteract anxiety. Um, teaching time management techniques mm -hmm. to try to prevent procrastination. So you're, you're just trying to build up what the client W would prefer and wishes was how they were living. Um, and of course, uh, I think any experienced therapist knows from lots of experience that when you work that way, you get partial incremental degrees of symptom reduction. Um, and, and even if they are effective at sometimes uh, relapses happen, they, they really aren't uh, potent to establish change in a stable way. So it's kind of a wobbly degree of change and it's partial change. And the very fact that it's a partial degree of change shows that whatever the source of the symptom or problem pattern is, is still there. And so the counteractive change is competing against the inner source of the, of the symptom. So when you're counteracting, you're actually increasing the divided self right mm -hmm. you're you're pitching one part of the person against the the part or whatever mm -hmm. that is is generating the symptom and because counteracting intrinsically fails in other words life will reactivate the symptom production process strongly in some situations and then the client feels they have personally failed to stick with the counteractive program that the ther you know the wise therapist has imparted it should work right it's supposed to work but it doesn't and clients tend to feel they have failed so mm. we're not really big on counteracting uh, does that come across <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well and really the main reason that we abandoned counteracting which wasn't easy by the way because i think most everyone has a very strong counteractive reflex it's it's culturally imbued, probably around the world, cross-culturally. I had my share of counteractive reflex that took me years and years to unlearn. I'd slide into counteractive work with a client without even realizing it, even though I was intending not to. It's a very deep reflex mm -hmm. in us, mm -hmm. uh, especially when a client is looking to us to do something to make their suffering stop, right? And mm -hmm. it's a big responsibility. Mm -hmm. And so there's a tendency to go counteractive. And it took quite a while to unlearn that. Well, what we found in our early years of uh, practice, and I'm referring to Laurel Hulley, my co-creator of coherence therapy, um, we were comparing notes early in our careers and found that very occasionally a client would have a remarkable breakthrough, mm -hmm. uh, a deep shift, a deeply felt shift. 
and and long-standing major symptoms w- would just disappear, stop, and not come back. And boy, was that a joy! But it was very occasional mm-hmm. back then, and and mysterious. We didn't know why it happened when it happened, but noticing that it can happen, we looked at each other and knew we need to figure out why that happens because that's what we want to do more regularly and know know how to facilitate that level of transformational change yeah. as as con- in contrast with incremental partial change where where major patterns really go, you know 100% change disappear and stay gone effortlessly whereas with counteractive change the client has to uh, forever make the effort of doing the preferred pattern it's an you know, it's a deliberate effort in competition, well, in transformational change, once the change has happened, it's it, it persists effortlessly. So we apply ourselves to uh, learning what makes that kind of change happen. So whenever it did happen with any clients for years, we studied what happened as closely as we could. And finally, uh, it, and it did take several years, um, we finally did recognize that a, a pattern that was present with every client with whom this kind of change happened. And the pattern was was independent of the particular symptoms or problems or, or the person's processing style. Although we would have to, what it took to get this pattern to happen, to create transformational change was different particulars with each client, but we found it was the same set of steps and the first step was reveal and bring into awareness the underlying what can we call it there's there's different phrases for it the underlying uh, uh, emotional learning from earlier in life the underlying schema the underlying mental model the underlying core beliefs or expectations about how the world functions. Well, it turns out that there is a rather well-defined underlying one of those uh, maintaining whatever the client's symptom is. And within the context of that version of reality, that schema or mental model, the presenting symptom is actually adaptive, not maladaptive, pathogenic, dysfunctional, the symptom is actually part of how the client is striving to have safety or protection or well-being or eliminate a certain suffering or prevent a certain suffering according to what is known in that schema. And we call that coherence, symptom coherence. So really that became the, the core principle of the first part of our methodology. How do you find that underlying emotional truth or schema within which the symptom is necessary, urgently necessary, um, know that, well, by by finding how the symptom is urgently necessary, rather than counteracting. You see, the moment you're counteracting, you're abandoning that therapeutic approach. Mm -hmm. To do that approach, you have to go toward the stuff causing all the trouble and reveal it. Whereas in counteracting, you're trying to get away from the stuff causing all the trouble, and you can't possibly reveal it that way. So that's why we had to unlearn the counteractive reflex to be efficient in heading toward that schema or mental model or core beliefs. Then we found that successfully bringing that into awareness by itself doesn't create change or transformational change. We had plenty of clients who would get in touch with what that whatever was underneath that was completely outside of awareness before. For example, for example, what? If I make any mistake, it really does mean I'm a worthless, unlovable thing, and I deserve the shaming that will come from any mistake. Doesn't matter how much I did right before, one mistake, and that's the truth. You know, a person gets in touch with that belief that schema that expectation and it's and it feel and it keeps and it still feels true and they come in next session and we review the 
the, the details of that. You see, that's what I mean by well-defined, mm -hmm. right? Before we found it, it seemed mysterious and blurry. Why do I go into such panic? Why am I so compulsively perfectionistic? Well, it's to avoid the mistake that shatters self-worth. Mm -hmm. Adaptive, according to that version of reality. Uh, but once it's conscious and the client's really in touch with it, both as an affective whole body experience and also verbally, conceptually, it doesn't necessarily make a dent. It still feels just as potent and true. So what is it that does uh, dissolve, dispel, eliminate, uh, decommission that version of reality? Well, we found that too. And that's the next step of the methodology that became coherence therapy. And it consists of what we called a juxtaposition experience in which the client is, you know, affectively in touch with that schema, as I was describing, and at the same time, concurrently, is in touch with their own experiences or perceptions or knowings that it absolutely is not the truth of reality. Not, uh, not convincing the client, not counteractively done, not trying to build it up, but finding something the client knows or perceives or has experienced that contradicts that schema. And with, uh, 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 well, with, I'll stick with the example I gave. I actually had a client who had that. And I'm sure any experienced therapist has had clients who have some variation of that schema. Sadly, it's very common. Um, well, there's a particular client with whom I did this. I said, uh, tell me, tell me, have you ever, have you ever been in a situation where your mistake or misstep became apparent to somebody? And, and they didn't react like that. Uh, this client learned that people will react like that because dad always did. Dad always just, you know, an arithmetic error when he was little or spilled some milk and dad blows up into rage. Like, how can you be so stupid? You know, even in front of visiting family members or whatever. Um, and this was frequent. So uh, so I asked him, you know, have you ever made a mistake in front of somebody? And they didn't respond like you expect based on dad. He had generalized that, that experience to all people. And now that the schema is conscious, exceptions, past opposite experiences came to mind readily. Like, well, I never thought of it this way, but yeah. And he named four or five instances from when he was young into up to up to last week with a coworker who had asked for the April figures and he sent the March figures and oops, sorry, here's the March figure. And the coworker was relaxed and friendly about it. So we had a list of about four or five of those since high school. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, so, okay, once he listed that for me, I said, look, let's go over and here's where I create the juxtaposition experience for him. Let's go over what you've experienced of making mistakes in your life. And first I reviewed how it was with dad and got him into the feeling of that, the horrible feeling of that. And, and here again is staying close to the stuff causing all the trouble, not getting away from it. The client has to be back in that stuff to create the juxtaposition both at once. Got him back into, yes, I expect anybody will react like that to me if I make a mistake. And then I said, and, and yet you're telling me that you yourself have experienced and I reviewed every one of them. Your high school English teacher was relaxed and friendly when you went to her and said, uh, you realize you wrote the term paper according to the wrong instructions. And then I reviewed each one, including the one last week with the coworker. And so you've, you've seen that people don't respond like that. How is it to be in touch with the dad expectation and your own experience? That's so different. There's the juxtaposition experience. That and, and hovering with that, staying with that for the rest of the session, even repeating it by empathetically reviewing it several times. That is what we finally noticed 
results in the full depotentiation of that underlying lifelong potent core belief or expectation. And, you know, the clients react to that juxtaposition in many different ways. Um, some burst out in a gleeful laughter uh, in, in, in the deep recognition that this horrible, oppressive version of reality isn't real, isn't the reality. That is so freeing that there's a joyous laughter that some people go into. Other people, uh, I've had clients go into a grimace. Uh, that's no less a marker of the change happening, but a grimace of distress because, uh, for example, uh, I'm thinking of one. Yeah, in fact, this same client, um, he came back and said, "Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not so afraid of making a mistake around people, but uh, actually, this wasn't a walk in the park because." If everybody isn't the same as dad, I mean, if everybody is the same as dad, then dad's a normal guy. Uh, but if I'm seeing that everybody's not like that, then dad looks real different and it's not good. Yeah. Dad, dad's a cruel guy. That was abuse. And I'm, I'm real agitated about seeing that. And we had to do several sessions of grief work and, and, and anger work in relation to dad for him to finally arrive at fully allowing the knowing that other people are not like that. He's not in danger of that with people. And so his perfectionism and his social anxiety disappeared. But it took that, there was a, you know, that kind of complication, that process was necessary to get all the way there. But, but anyway. I'm glad you use that as an example because it's, it's easy to think coherence is finding the schema and dissolving the schema and then, but there's, there's, it's complexity. There's time for grief work and emotional processing. and work. Absolutely. It's with some clients, it's necessary. Sometimes, sometimes it is poof. It's amazing. Uh, but there's often complications like that that have to be skillfully uh, navigated like that and to get the full like, effect. Yeah. When, when you're talking about the, the both and is how much you weren't leaning, you weren't tipping the scale toward one or the other which I think would be tempting to do for yes. a new therapist to say, yes. oh my gosh, you can see this is wrong, clearly wrong because we have this other evidence and can we just prefer this is the truth? Yes. <laughs> you know? yes. and I love well, that's the counteractive reflex that's slipping in. Exactly, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, again, we had to master that and it took a while, uh, but you, the, what you're emphasizing is so important, Tori, uh, that you're just putting the client in front of both with no zero indication of preference or which is the true version. You're, you're, we learn by seeing that this process is, exists in the client, in the brain, we learn to trust it. We learn to trust that the client's brain and mind will update reality through the juxtaposition. We don't need to to, you know, it's it's this one. It's not this one. No, yeah. no need, no need. And in fact, you interfere with the process yeah. when you do any of that. Is that because it takes you up up into your head where you rush? Yes, you know? exactly, exactly. It takes you up into controlling the process and out of the fully experiential uh, flow of yeah. that process. That was yeah, the that, thing I was really noticing as you were describing is it's non counteractive for sure and there's another piece of being non-interpretive. So, so from mm -hmm. both, if we're going to fill out the picture a little bit there, right. it's different um, to, to access these knowings. It, it would have been easy, for instance, for a therapist to have a, such a, a history in mind and say, oh gosh, you go to shame client. Let me explain to you because your father shamed you. So you probably expect others will as well. You know, I mean, you know, it, it wouldn't be hard for a, a client, a therapist to map that out ahead you know of, of where that's we right that's right that's another big temptation and so many therapists are, are trained to do that yeah, to make an interpretation really? yeah, they, you know it's, that's that's perfectly valid therapy in in many approaches um yeah 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 this the but the coherence the symptom coherence principle guides the fully experiential eliciting of that underlying stuff with zero interpretation and that's another uh, yeah, a rule we follow is to is to refrain from any interpreting or conceptual explaining in order to get there. Mm -hmm. So 
you know, sometimes I'll just, I'll stop myself and have to kind of like get quiet and, and look for how do I make this show up, not explain it. Yes. And I'll, I actually, I'll, I, I think if I mention how I did it with that fellow, it'll yes, be, please. it'll help illuminate this important point. Uh, when he, in the first session, when he described the pattern, uh, uh, which he did, which he and he started off. The starting point was he came in to say, "I want to get free of something that's been with me my whole life." He was in his mid forties. Um, when I'm around people, I lock up. I, I I get tight and and locked up. I I can't. I don't find words. I don't flow. I, I'm, and, and and people feel it, and it's awkward, and it embarrasses me, and it makes them not want to hang out with me. I can tell. Um, uh, and so I said, well, does, does it feel like anxiety when you're among people? And he, he, oh, I guess so. Which meant he's not in touch with his affect either. He just, just the, that locked up somatic state. And so, uh, I said, okay, let's, let's, what does it feel like something that you're not safe? Does it feel like uh, something's not, something's not safe? He said, well, yeah. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, that's true. Which also was new, but at least it, he, it was truth. Um, that's how out of touch with himself he was. Um, and okay, not safe. Would you like to start to find out what is not safe among people? He said, well, yeah, yeah, I would. So I said, all right, let, let this sentence complete itself. I want you to, I'm going to give you a half sentence. You say it yourself out loud without pre-thinking the ending and see what your mind pops up to end it with. Here's the half sentence. I better not just talk freely while I'm with these people because if I did, these underlying core beliefs or expectations or schemas are far outside of awareness but if you give them a half sentence that matches closely enough what they care about, they can't resist finishing the sentence. Yeah. And so he said the half sentence and, and he hit the blank and he said, uh, what's coming isn't words. Uh, I'm getting an image of my father just exploding with rage. Well, that, that really was the, the best finishing of the sentence. That's the truth of it. Uh, and, and we just stayed with that and unpacked and clarified that. And by the end of the, by the end of the first session, we got to that schema that I, verbal, we got the words. He was feeling it right away. As soon as that image of dad came, he was in it. But he didn't have cognitive, metacognitive clarity of what is this I'm feeling with dad exploding with rage. And so we kind of clothed that invisible schema with words. And by the end of the first session, we got to the, the wording I, I shared earlier. Um, if I make any mistake, uh, people will react like dad. And, um, uh, you know, I'm worthless and everybody knows it. And I deserve the shaming that will come. Got to it that way. So you see, there was no interpreting yeah. at all. It was a completely experiential process of bringing it out of him so that I learn it from him. That's our when we train therapists in this approach, that's what we emphasize. You learn it from the client. You have to make it show up experientially. The client reveals it and you learn it from the client and with the client. Yeah, yeah very important point. No interpreting either. Yeah. Phenomenological. I, that's what I understand the word phenomenological to mean. Where, where finding it in the client as it lives and operates in the client without importing our own meanings. We, we also describe this as uh, the, uh, having an anthropologist's view as we do this initial discovery work, right? Because we have to know we don't know what's there in the client. It's a, it's a unique world of meaning that we have to learn. You, you know, you, an anthropologist doesn't go into a village and tell them how to make sense of things, right? That's ridiculous. It's the opposite. And it's exactly the same in this process as we do the discovery work. Oh, wow, Bruce. I'm just so aware of that we 
it feels like we've been talking for two minutes and that we could talk another hour. Easy, <laughs> easily. <laughs> um, so I really appreciate, but I think, I think we might um, close this video here because, you know, to keep it short and then we'll do another one as well. Another interview um, in the next video, I'm going to read an example case um, where we do some, some of the pieces like the example you just gave, and then I'll, and then we'll come back together and have another interview as, as part five of the series, looking more at the science of what we've been talking about today. Right. Great models, and um, so I hope people stay tuned. And any any final thoughts before we we end, or should we just close there? The only thought there is, hey, this was fun. This was fun. I always love hanging out with you, Bruce. So appreciate it's mutual. It. <laughs> All right, yeah. thank you, everyone. Take care. Welcome, friends. Come inside. Thank you for watching. If you have enjoyed my content, I would love if you would consider subscribing to my channel. You can even become a member for early access to videos. Also, if you would like to connect with me and the community I'm building while gaining access to exclusive content, please click on the link below to my Patreon page. A special thanks to my patrons. You guys really make it possible for me to focus on creating videos and being able to offer them for free. So thank you.